Paul is the professor of psychiatry at the Western Institute of the University of Pittsburgh and has been interested in pharmacotherapy of borderline personality disorder for some time. And he'll talk about serotonin 2A receptor binding in borderline personality disorder. Paul. All right, I'm going to be presenting today uh, work that deals with the receptor level of analysis and its involvement in regulation of affect and uh, impulsive behavior. Uh, I'm going to present first an overview of work that led up to our interest in the 5-HT2A receptor and then finally launch into a current study that is underway. Uh, with apologies, I must tell you that this, the database that we're presenting is still being analyzed. So not only is this hot off the press, but it's still being, the numbers are still being crunched. So you're going to be seeing some uh, very recent data. These are my collaborators in this effort. Uh, Julie Price is the nuclear physicist. Carolyn Meltzer, the neuroradiologist. Tony Fabio is our statistician. Guido Frank and uh, Walter Kay have preceded me in doing uh, brilliant work with uh, 5-HT2A analysis in eating disorders. The focus of my research, which is funded by the NIMH, is the neurobiology, the psychobiology of suicidal behavior. Um, in previous presentations for the NEA, I've presented um, psychosocial data and analyses of risk factors uh, that are associated with suicidal behavior in borderline patients. Today, I'm going to be focusing exclusively on the biologic piece. Uh, as you all know, suicidal behavior is one of the most important and significant clinical presentations of borderline personality disorder. And as John Gunderson has noted, uh, it is often the borderline patient's behavioral specialty. Why is suicide of such interest in borderline personality disorder? Well, the numbers tell the tale. About half of parasuicides admitted to hospital carry a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. About a third of community suicides have borderline personality disorder as an associated diagnosis. In my own studies, we looked at consecutively admitted borderline inpatients and found that over 70% had attempted suicide with an average of 3.3 uh, lifetime attempts. This is very, very similar to a consecutively studied uh, borderline patients in an outpatient clinic and has been replicated over and over again. So a very high proportion of borderline patients actually attempt. The completed suicide rate for borderline patients varies from study to study depending on the population, depending on the, the center that's used to study the patients, the period of outcome, the longitudinal follow-up, but it ranges from 3 to a maximum of about 10 percent. The average age of death by suicide in the most comprehensive of these studies was 37 years. My own ongoing longitudinal study, our current rate of premature death uh, is about 5%, and we, our average age right now is 27, so we expect that number, unfortunately, to, to rise over time. Now, why are we looking at serotonin in suicidal behavior? Well, it's been known for many years that among individuals who completed suicide among high lethality attempters and impulsive subjects with borderline personality disorder, even those independent of suicidal behavior, there are a series of biological findings that point to aberrations in the serotonergic system. The earliest such finding was a decrease in the spinal fluid CSF5HIAA. 5HIAA is the major metabolite of serotonin. So all of these categories of lethal behaviors or impulsive behaviors had decreased levels of CSF5-HIAA compared to control subjects. Secondly, there's a blunted response of the serotonergic neurotransmitter system in the brain. This is measured by giving 
drugs such as uh, D or DL fenfluramine or MCPP, which are serotonergic agonists and reuptake inhibitors. The normal response to receiving a drug like this is that your brain pumps out uh, a hormone called prolactin, also cortisol, which can be measured in the blood, whereas we can't measure uh, serotonin levels in the blood that are meaningful. In individuals who have impulsivity, impulsive aggression, and or suicidal behavior, much of which is impulsive suicidal behavior, there's a blunted prolactin response to serotonergic agonists such as fenfluramine or MCPP. Again, a very, very old finding. And a correlate of that finding is that there's always an, in, there is an inverse relationship between impulsivity, aggression, and the response to fenfluramine. So that the blunted response, the failure of the serotonergic system to respond uh, is a, a marker for individuals who have uh, impulsive aggression. It may be the mediating chemistry of impulsivity and aggression. What we're saying is that impulsivity and aggression in some individuals may be mediated, caused by uh, diminished levels of serotonergic neurotransmission in parts of the brain. Now this brings us up to the modern methods, the most recent methods. Everything I've described to this point has been nonspecific as far as area of the brain involved. The old spinal fluid studies, for example, treated spinal fluid as though it's motor oil. It bathes the brain. You pick it up by sticking a needle in the bottom of the spine. About 75% of the CSF5HIA that you sample that way comes from the spinal cord, not the brain itself. Very indirect. Same thing with the Fen Challenge. Uh, it's unclear as to exactly what parts of the brain are involved in that serotonergic response. So they're non-selective for neuroanatomy, that is the regional area of the brain involved. That's a, an area which we approach with the imaging techniques. Now imaging studies have been applied to borderline personality disorder as you've seen this morning uh, very brilliantly uh, by Dr. Konigsberg and Dr. Schmal. We now have good studies that are structural studies using MRI, which are analyzed by even look, either looking at specific measured areas of the brain, such as Dr. Schmal illustrated, called uh, regions of interest, or looking at, at the total brain using a method called voxel-based morphometry, which I'll show in a few minutes. We've seen examples of fMRI studies, Dr. Konigsberg's study. Um, looking at how the brain functions metabolically, we can use PET scans. Now, PET scans can be paired with a variety of other provocative paradigms. For example, using the serotonergic drugs while the pa patient is undergoing the PET scan. Fenfluramine, uh, Dr. Siever, Dr. New, and myself have done studies such as that MCPP, Dr. New has published. You can use behavioral paradigms uh, such as Dr. Schmall's uh, abandonment scripts while the patient is undergoing PET scans. Uh, Dr. Sievers recently reported on the transporter binding sites uh, of the uh, neurons. You can look at specific receptors, which is what I'm going to be presenting this morning. There are two other areas of imaging technology which are rather new uh, as far as their application toward borderline personality disorder. There's one study in the literature of magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, I believe Dr. Roche, who is here with us today, uh, is involved in that. Um, and there is a, an even newer technology, diffusion tensor imaging, which um, Dr. Kukara will be des uh, describing in his presentation. As a, a personal note of caution, I have to point out that the technology has far exceeded our understanding that when we apply a new technology to borderline patients as opposed to control patients and we find a difference, we're at a loss often to understand what that difference means behaviorally. Nonetheless, we've presented, and the pieces are beginning to come together, um, especially around the structural and some of the functional work. But it's still very, very much um, an open area. We still don't understand all of what we're describing. However, it is clear that certain areas of the brain are mentioned over and over and over again in the structural and functional literature as being aberrant in patients with borderline personality disorder compared to controls. You've heard these words this morning, uh, and I'm going to just underline them for you. Areas, regions of interest that are involved in affective and behavioral regulation in the prefrontal area of the brain, prefrontal cortex, especially the orbital frontal and ventromedial areas, and I'm going to show those to you in a minute. 
These are involved in emotional processing and working memory. Uh, excuse me, emotional processing. Working memory uh, is primarily the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is also uh, aberrant, more in schizophrenic perhaps than in the borderline patients. Anterior cingulate cortex you've heard about this morning is involved in modulating emotional intensity. Uh, the amygdala certainly is important in recognition of aversive faces and fear conditioning. The hippocampus, which I will focus on, um, is a warehouse, as it were, of emotional memories and has as one of its major functions the reconciliation of your memory base of your past experience with what's coming in to your perception at the current time. So the hippocampus is involved in reconciling your internal state and your external reality. Now we've talked about these as though they're discrete areas of the brain that somehow have an encapsulated function. Actually what we believe is that these areas of the brain all talk to each other in neural circuits. And that disruption in circuits that involve these areas, which are frontotemporal primarily, um, result in the syndromes of affective dysregulation and impulsive aggressive behavior. It's a circuit that's being disrupted, not necessarily one small uh, piece uh, that's causing the whole syndrome. I'm going to show you some examples from my own research uh, of different kinds of imaging, and then we'll launch into the, the current study. Uh, this is voxel-based morphometry study. Okay. This is a voxel-based morphometry study. Basically, it's a structural method using MRI technology. And what you're looking at here is a comparison of borderline patients with healthy controls, and the areas that are highlighted uh, in yellow are areas in which there are significant reductions in gray matter, gray matter concentrations in borderline patients compared to normal controls. In other words, these are areas where there is less cortical matter. Now, the, where is the area? The area that's circled in this horizontal view is the anterior cingulate. And you've heard a lot about the anterior cingulate from the various presenters. Dr. New has highlighted its importance. Dr. Schmal has highlighted its importance. Dr. Konigsberg has highlighted. It's the area of the brain, one of the areas of the brain involved in circuits that modulate emotional intensity. So in borderline patients compared to healthy controls, there's a decrease in the, vol in the con we call gray matter concentration in this particular kind of technology. There are also decreases in the medial temporal lobe. Now this is the area where the hippocampus lives. The areas that you're looking at actually that are lit up are parahippocampal gyrus, uncus, and amygdala. This is a coronal view of the same thing, highlighting the medial temporal findings. And in a sample looking only at females, we find that most of the significance of our uh, differences are attributable to the female sample. So we looked at our female sample and we asked the next level of an analytic question, what's special about the female sample? Uh, is there a connection with abuse? Now these are female borderline patients who have been abused compared to female borderline patients who are, have not been abused. So we've eliminated any of the variance that comes with being borderline itself. And lo and behold, at least in one area of the uh, medial temporal, uh, in the area of the parahippocampus, um, uh, uncus and, and amygdala, we find abnormalities, that is, diminished uh, gray matter concentration in medial temporal cortex in abused borderline women as opposed to non-abused borderline women. Again, you've heard similar stories before. You've heard this being presented over and over again. This is just another way using a different technology of replicating the same kind of finding. There appears to be a very firm and solid finding at this point. How about functional imaging? Well, what you're looking at now is a PET scan, a series of PET scans essentially that have compared uh, female borderline patients to female controls. The areas in uh, yellow, orange, represent areas where the uptake of the radio-labeled glucose, which is how PET scans operate, the area of diminished uptake 
in borderline patients compared to control subjects. Uh, this means that in normal, well, this means that in borderline subjects, just at rest, not doing any tasks, not receiving any drugs, just in the PET scanner, compared to normal individuals, these individuals have a hypofrontal de uh, deficiency. Or hypofrontalism is another word for it. Diminished metabolis metabolism and prefrontal cortex. Um, you're looking specifically at the orbitofrontal area of the cortex. So there's something wrong at baseline in borderline patients' metabolism in this area of the brain. Now, why is the orbitofrontal area of the brain so important? Well, because the orbitofrontal area of the brain is one of the areas of the brain which regulates our release of affect and our release of behavior. Or to say it in its reverse, it is part of the inhibitory mechanism of the brain. When you damage the orbital, frontal, ventromedial part of the cor uh, frontal cortex, you become disinhibited. Uh, what you're looking at now is a rather famous reconstruction uh, by Hannah and um, Antonio Damasio, two uh, psychiatrists and neuroanatomists, who reconstructed uh, the brain using uh, MRI technology and a little wizardry, reconstructed the brain of a man named Phineas Gage who was uh, injured in mid-19th century in a very unusual way. Actually, I should, as a side note, say I'm, you're probably going to see these slides again several times. I'm pleased that I'm the first of the group today <laughs> to get to show them. I, I usually find myself having to explain or show something that's been shown before. Why is Phineas Gage of great interest to us? Uh, this man, this poor man, um, worked as a supervisor on a railroad. And one day, his uh, unfortunate uh, job involved checking the tamping down in, a, in stone, which contained blasting powder. They were blowing away rocks to make room for the railroad. And as part of this process, you put a wad of tamping cotton in it, you have gunpowder, and you take a tamping rod, which is about two and a half feet long, and you tamp it down. Well, that day, uh, someone had forgotten to put the wad of cotton over the gunpowder. And so when Mr. Gage stood over it and pounded down the gunpowder, it exploded, driving the two and a half foot long spike through his head. And you can see uh, the Damasio's reconstruction of what happened to him, reconstructed from his skull, which ended up, I believe, on a shelf at Harvard Medical School. <laughs> Um, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Gage survived this. He had injuries which we believe, if you believe the reconstruction, were in the orbitofrontal and ventromedial part of his brain. It's his behavior that makes him a, an icon in neurology. Uh, Mr. Gage went from being a, a God-fearing, uh, honest citizen who was a supervisor, an up-and-coming worker for his company, to being a profane and uh, impulsive, aggressive, alcohol-abusing individual who eventually left his family and uh, died, apparently, an alcoholic in, in uh, San Francisco. How his head or his brain ended up at Harvard, we don't know. Okay. The importance is that this is exactly the same area that I've shown you where we have deficits in uptake of glucose in borderline patients. It's exactly the same area where uh, neurologic damage causes disinhibition syndromes. Now, I've mentioned that we can pair PET scans with um, PET technology. And Dr. Seaver was a pioneer in this. And I followed, and Dr. New has, has done uh, excellent work in this area. But I want to call your, these are our pilot studies in which we gave borderline patients and controls d fenfluramine Remember, it's a serotonergic releaser and reuptake inhibitor. So it jump starts the serotonin system by f causing firing of serotonergic neurons and then Re, uh, blocking their reuptake. So this essentially, when I show this to my medical students, I say, this is, this is your brain on fenfluramine. Now, this is what I want you to look at. This is a normal individual, or it's, it's actually it's a pooled picture of, a normal, of normal individuals with fenfluramine stimulation. So you're looking at the metabolic increase in activity caused by supercharging the serotonergic system in the prefrontal cortex. This is all prefrontal cortex. Remember the hole in Mr. Gage's head? That's what you're looking at here. This is what happens in borderline patients. Nothing. 
Now, nothing is not a statistical statement. Uh, it, it is significantly less than what you see in control individuals. And I only show this slide because it's so dramatic. Uh, but basically, we're again looking at a diminished responsiveness in orbitofrontal and ventral medial parts of the prefrontal cortex in borderline patients, a diminished responsiveness to serotonergic probing suggesting a diminished serotonergic neurotransmission in the borderline patient in that area of the brain. That area of the brain is important because it controls behavior. It's an inhibitory center. So it's, it's important in executive functioning. Now, so we've gone from structure to metabolism. Now we have areas of the brain that we're looking at. We're at the level of localization. And you've heard a lot of anatomical terms today. It's, it's almost confusing. However, more importantly, perhaps, is at the level of how the neurons work. They work by discharging neurotransmitters. They work by stimulating receptors. So we need to talk about the neurochemistry of receptors. And this is of great importance because that's how we believe our medications work. We believe our medications work by altering neuroceptor receptivity, sensitivity, and transmission of, neuro of uh, neurotransmitters. So characterizing the function of receptors in borderline patients and other disorders could conceivably uh, direct us toward the chemistry of drugs that might be helpful in regulating these syndromes. That's the overriding rationale. We're looking at the serotonin 2A receptor, 5-HT2A, the serotonin 2A receptor. Why did we choose to look at that first? Well, in suicide studies, that is in studies of post-mortem studies of individuals who have died by suicide, <clears throat> there's an increase in the 5-HT2A receptor number in the ventral lateral and orbital frontal cortex. The 5-HT2A receptor is a postsynaptic receptor. That is, it's on the receiving end of the serotonergic neurotransmission. It's across the gap. It gets the message. In theory, if there is insufficient transmission across that gap, across those uh, synapses, there will be an increase in the number of the receptors. The receptor, win think of it this way, the windows open up to get more and more. Because there's less coming across, the windows open up to receive more serotonergic input. So when uh, Dr. Vicky Aranjo, of, now of Columbia, and, and Dr. John, working with Dr. John Mann, also now of Columbia, uh, described increased postsynaptic receptor number in these areas of the brain. It suggested diminished serotonergic neurotransmission or function in an area of the brain that's critically involved in regulating uh, expression of impulse. Okay. So as I said, this is our hypothesis, that there's decreased serotonergic agonism in prefrontal cortex, or pre cortex resulting in postsynaptic upregulation of, of the 5-HD2A receptor number or increased receptor sensitivity. And that this decreased serotonergic agonism in the prefrontal cortex is associated with impulsivity, aggression, and increased risk of suicidal behavior. This is pretty much a restatement of uh, the hypotheses that's driven a lot of the research that you've heard this morning. Now I'm going to get into the specifics of the study. As I say, this is a study that's still ongoing and we're still analyzing the data. So please bear with me if I get somewhat technical. Uh, this is a study that's open to both males and females between the age of 18 and, six, 18 and 46. We do our diagnoses rather uh, typically using uh, structured interviews, the SCID for axis one, the IPDE for axis two. Our subjects are all uh, diagnosed as borderline using the International Personality Disorder Examination and Gunderson uh, and Zanarini's diagnostic interview for borderline patients. We have an additional requirement since we're looking for those that are the most impulsive, we require that they have a maximum score on this scale in the impulsivity section. In addition, we look at other measures of personality functioning, uh, the lifetime history of aggression, uh, Cloninger's temperament and character inventory. We look at the Hamilton, the Busterkey hostility inventory, the Barrett impulsiveness scale. We have exclusionary criteria, of course. We don't look at bipolar. We look at no bipolar patients. There are no bipolars here and no one with other psychotic diagnoses. The controls, by the way, are squeaky clean. Control people have no lifetime access one or lifetime access two. Everybody's medication free. That includes birth control pills. Uh, they say that they're drug and alcohol free. We actually test. 
And then uh, when we uh, get histories, we uh, find that uh, everyone has been free at least five days with a mean of 17.5. And obviously, they're, uh, they, at the day of the scan itself, uh, they're clean as far as their urinalysis concerning drugs or pregnancy. Okay, we use altanserin. Altanserin is a radio ligand that is an antagonist. It binds to the 5-HT2A receptor. It kind of grabs onto the receptor and um, it discharges its positrons. We can actually uh, image where the firing occurred so you can actually see where the altanserin is, minimally to the 5-HT2C receptor. Uh, let me move ahead here a little. Now, the study design, we also look at specific areas of the brain. Uh, we'll be looking at the anterior cingulate. Anterior cingulate has two branches as far as our analysis is concerned, um, the pregenual and the subgenual. We look at the lateral orbital frontal, the medial orbital frontal. These are in the, the front of the brain, the medial frontal cortex. In the temporal part of the brain, we look at the medial temporal cortex, which has two areas that we look at specifically, the hippocampus and amygdala. We look at the occiput, the thalamus, and the cerebellum. Cerebellum is our control region. Uh, these are <clears throat> the data was analyzed by two separate methods, and I'm not going to go into detail here, uh, except to say that uh, the data are corrected for any atrophy, that is, takes into account uh, any uh, CSF, or think of it this way, it, it, it corrects for the different uh, amount of matter, gray matter, uh, white matter in the brain, size of the brain, if you will. Uh, the binding potential is the way we express the outcome variable. And I'm going to show you, by and large, I'm going to show you pooled uh, data for the entire brain. That's left and right side pooled. Uh, but we do have data lateralized in, the, in one of the samples. Okay. Skip it. Now, our, <clears throat> our sample at present involves 40 subjects. There are 19 borderlines and 21 controls. Uh, the average age uh, is 26.6 years. There is comorbidity. This is, the, this is the confound in every major study of borderline personality disorder. You have to worry about what's on axis one. Uh, borderline personality disorder is a personality style. These folks get depressed, and they get anxious, and they get substance abuse. And so we take count of that and try to co-vary for it in the analysis. Um, as you see, we have some individuals who have major depression, and we will make a point of that later, some individuals uh, with uh, substance use. Now, among the uh, borderline sample, 15 of these individuals were suicide attempters. That's 15 out of 19. That's pretty much what I expect. Uh, they range from zero to seven attempts, or the non uh, sorry, I have to correct that. They range from one to seven attempts with a mean of 2.0 attempts. Uh, a large number of these individuals, as you know from, the, from uh, Dr. Schmall's presentation, a large number of these individuals report sexual abuse. We had six individuals reporting sexual abuse, nine reporting physical abuse. When we looked at the psychological uh, parameters, the borderline patients, as expected, are more impulsive than controls. That's the Barrett impulsiveness scale. As expected, they have more depressive features, more depression than the controls. However, we got an interesting uh, surprise in our sample, uh, there was no statistical difference. It was close, but it, no statistical difference in the amount of aggression found in the borderline patients and their controls. Uh, 0 0.1 is, well, I guess you can call it a trend, but it's still not significant. There were no differences in age or uh, body meta uh, basal metabolic index or in the females days from the onset of menses to the PET scan. These are important technical features. I'm going to be presenting this is a little bit different than what's in your book, but I'm going to be presenting the females first, and then the males, then the controls. Why did I choose to do this? We found enormous differences by gender. I'm kind of speaking ahead of myself. So I'm going to be presenting the females, which have been, this data has recently been published in biological psychiatry and is the best analyzed. We had 14 uh, borderline females, 11 controls. Again, age range, um, similar ages. Uh, the comorbidity was interesting. We had, of the, board, the borderline patients, five of them had major depression, and we did analyze for that later on. Twelve were suicide attempters. We found no significant group differences in these parameters 
uh, what you're looking at essentially are the sorts of control parameters that you, the technical parameters. You want to be sure that you don't introduce any bias in the technical differences so that the, the partial volume corrections, amount of CSF, size of the brain was similar in the two groups. Uh, the way they handled the metabolites of the radio labeled ligand were similar in the two groups. Um, there was the non-binding amount of the radioactive label was similar in the two groups. But I do want to make one point here that runs through all of our data analysis and will confound everything. That binding potential to the 5-HT2A receptor is inversely related to age in borderline personality disorder and in normal controls. Now, that has powerful ramifications in other areas of psychiatry. By every decade, every 10 years of your life, you lose about 6% of your 5-HT2A receptors. Again, it is of, it's a nuisance to me in working with borderline patients. As I have to co-vary for it. I have to account for it statistically. But if you're doing geriatric research, it becomes of great interest. And there are people who are looking at this phenomenon as perhaps a vulnerability phenomenon to older age depressions or anxiety disorders. We all lose about 6% of our um, 5-HT2A receptors every 10 years. Okay, so first let's look at the girls. Altanserin binding in BPD females was greater than binding in uh, the normal controls in all 10 of our regions of interest, all 10 of those anatomical areas. However, only the hippocampus uh, was significant in both the two kinds of analyses we did. Remember, we said we were doing two different kinds of, of analysis of the data. Now, the first level of analysis does not take age into consideration. The second level of analysis does. And there are some statistical things that we do first. We had to make sure our, our data was uh, normally distributed, and it is. So basically, at the second level of analysis, we were allowed to control or covary for age. And when you covary for age, you find even more areas of significant difference. The hippocampus, borderline females greater than healthy controls. The occipital cortex, borderline females greater than uh, medial temporal. Now, the medial temporal contains the hippocampus. It contains the hippocampus and the amygdala. And there's a trend in lateral orbital frontal. Well, I put that one in because later on I'm going to be trying red face to explain why my hypothesis didn't succeed because that's the one that we were counting on. That's where we put our money. The hippocampus turned out to be a surprise. Now, this is a slide that illustrates the significant finding in the hippocampus with borderline females having increased binding. Again, let me repeat the hypothesis. Increased binding is implying increased number of receptor sites, which is implying decreased amounts of serotonin. This is the compensatory postsynaptic upregulation. Those are the fancy words to explain opening up more windows when there's too little neurotransmitter. So this slide suggests that that's happening in the hippocampus, which is rather surprising. Now, what if we just look at the suicide attempters? Just the girls who attempted suicide. We find that borderline females greater than control females in the hippocampus, the medial temporal cortex, which again is confounded because it includes the hippocampus, the occiput and the lateral orbital frontal, all with age covaried. So essentially the same finding as before um, with age covaried. And the, the covariance of the age is very, very important. So this becomes a more uh, robust finding. However, we didn't find that the binding potential was related to depression, abuse, lifetime number of suicide attempts, and it was not related to impulsivity or lifetime history of aggression. Remember our hypothesis? That's what, so we're I'm a little already I'm in trouble. Now, in other areas, um, it's been shown that the 5-HT2A receptor number increases uh, in depressed individuals compared to non-depressed individuals. This is in the affective disorders research field outside of borderline. Looking at depression, remember we had five of our girls had, had comorbid major depression. It turns out that the binding potential in this sample for the non-depressed borderlines was significantly greater than that of the depressed borderlines and greater than that of the controls. 
an unexpected finding. It's, in the, it's the opposite that you'd expect, that you predict from the depression literature. Something different is working here in the borderline patients. And our, our depressed borderline patients also, well, when you compare those to, to healthy controls, it's identical. It's the non-depressed borderline patients in our sample uh, who have the significance, who have the increased binding potential. So this is the, we started trying to find out what could relate to this finding. How do we explain this finding? Uh, impulsivity didn't explain it, and aggression didn't explain it. So we looked at our other measures of personality functioning. And this is the data that's still being turned out, basically. So what I'm going to show you now is, rather, is, is still rather preliminary. And we have lots of correlations. So uh, those of you who like to make theories can start spinning theories about correlations. We correlate positively with novelty seeking, harm avoidance, reward dependence, hostility and aggression. But when you control for age, aggression, when you control for age, when you control for group, that is borderline or healthy control, um, these differences disappear. Let's look at the boys. Five male borderlines, 10 healthy controls. Right away, we have too few males to make a lot of con uh, conclusions. Our males were screened, we learned from experience, so we didn't include any uh, people with major depression. And what we found in the males was that the males had less binding than healthy controls. It's the opposite finding than the females. With age co-varied, less binding in the medial frontal cortex, occiput, with trends in the lateral orbital frontal and hippocampus. This is what it looks like. And you can see in every one of those contrasts, uh, the males are less than the controls. It's the opposite to the females. And the hippocampus, of course, is significant here, but in the opposite direction. Okay, we also, again, have correlations, and I'm going to skim over this because the bottom line is that when you put these in regression equations and you co-vary for, for age, uh, a lot of the, a lot but not all of the findings uh, become non-significant. We do have some significant findings in the males. Um, impulsivity is related to the occipital finding. It's inversely related. Uh, one of Cloninger's variables, fatigability, uh, contributes to the lateral orbital frontal. Harm avoidance contributes to the anterior cingulate. Uh, these are highly significant, but we need larger numbers to really be certain of what they mean. Okay, now, the final <laughs> blow to this theory that I've been spinning. When we looked at healthy controls, we have enough healthy controls to do a good statistical comparison. We have 10 normal males, 11 normal females. That's a decent sample for at least healthy cult control comparisons. They're not exactly matched. It turns out in our sample, males have a little bit more harm avoidance than females, and males are always more aggressive than females. These are normal males. Now, the binding potentials, however, males are greater than females. There are statistically significant differences between groups in hippocampus, lateral orbital frontal, and thalamus, and we have trends in three other areas. And this is what it looks like. These are normal individuals. So now we have a bigger puzzle. We have problems explaining how we have uh, these variations in normal individuals. OK. Let me move ahead to some of these. I'm short of time, but I have to move ahead a little bit. Our results were unexpected. In healthy subjects, healthy controls, um, and in neuroanatomical studies, most 5-HT2A binding is in the frontal and the prefrontal cortex, much less in the hippocampus or the amygdala, and yet our findings were in hippocampus or amygdala. In our study, our, our differences between groups, between borderlines and controls in the orbital frontal area uh, were trends only. Oh, they were there. They were trends, 0 0.08, 0 0.06, but they weren't as robust. They weren't statistically significant compared to the others. In addition, we found marked, marked gender differences. That binding potential was increased in borderline females, decreased in borderline males versus controls, and increased in healthy males versus females. We have some problems here. We do a lot of comparisons. So we get into a statistical problem called type 1 error. Some of our correlations may not be right. Um, our male sample is still pretty small. 
to, to warrant uh, robust conclusion. But we, we have to focus on the hippocampus now. That was our strongest finding. The MRI studies found loss of volume in hippocampus. They found that was associated with history of childhood abuse. Um, Dr. Schmal presented that work to you. There's only one PET study that commented on the hippocampus. Most PET studies don't look at the hippocampus, but only one uh, did look at it and showed a decreased uptake of glucose in the hippocampus. That was Jungling's research. And there's one water study uh, using O15 labeled water, which showed decrease in cerebral blood flow in hippocampus. Uh, and this is Dr. Schmal's work uh, in borderline patients exposed to his abandonment scripts. So maybe one study in each technology commenting on abnormalities in the hippocampus. It's not a lot. What's the functional significance? What does it mean? Well, other studies looking at the 5-HT2A have associated decreased serotonergic agonism in the hippocampus with low self-esteem hopelessness, and dysfunctional attitudes. Well, one study, a good one by Dr. Meyer in Canada, studying individuals with suicidal ideation and self-harm behaviors, all of whom had borderline and or major depression, coincidentally, he found that the binding potential was related to scores on a dysfunctional attitude scale, independent of depression. That when you gave fenfluramine to control individuals that whatever dysfunctional attitudes they had improved in the, at least their scores. So he felt that the dis, this dysfunctional attitudes, a negatively biased view of oneself, the world, and the future were somehow related to serotonergic agonism activity. What's a dysfunctional attitude? I had to go back to the books to figure out what a dysfunctional attitude was. <laughs> so this is from Dr. Weissman and Beck's dysfunctional attitude scale. Not related to depression per se, but uh, the examples, if I fail at my work, then I'm a failure as a person. My happiness depends on, more on other people than it does on me, and there are 40 such items. So dysfunctional attitudes are related to decreased serotonergic activity in the hippocampus, according to Dr. Meyer. So is the binding potential in the hippocampus related to cognitive impairment? We really don't know, because we didn't look at measures of cognition. The hippocampus is definitely involved in, associ in updating associative memory, in monitoring and reconciling internal emotional states and external stimuli. It's the reality check. It checks what's happening in the outside world with your memories of what you've had, well, how you experience, and then advises the prefrontal cortex on what to do. Go ahead, punch him. Go ahead, kiss her. Stop. Go home. Based on previous experience. It has extensive reciprocal connections to the orbital and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So it has a role in modulating affective and behavioral uh, uh, release. We believe then that aberrations in this connectivity, in this circuit, may contribute to affective instability or dysfunctional attitudes associated with borderline personality disorder. But quite frankly, it's still an open question. We don't have a very good understanding uh, of what the hippocampus does uh, in borderline patients. And yet, we have a very robust finding uh, that it's abnormal, at least serotonergic um, function is abnormal in that area. And gender differences. Gender differences in, the, in neurobiology may contribute to differences in affective and impulsive behavior in healthy men and women, as well as in borderlines. We just don't understand the roles of these different um, circuits in, in modulating behavior yet. So as I said, the technology is way ahead of our understanding in these areas. So I wanted to finish with, uh, since I'm in New York, I thought I'd quote a, a famous New York philosopher, Yogi Berra. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And that's what's happening to us in this field. So thank you for your patience. Thanks, Paul. We'll open it up to questions now. Do we have any cards? Let me ask a question while we're waiting. Um, there's a, an important question here, what the two-way finding, if there is a finding, means in terms of compensatory versus primary or synergistic. And they have two quite different conclusions. The reason I bring it up, we've talked to the preclinical literature, Sanders-Bush and others, 
for serotonin as opposed to the catecholamines do not suggest upregulation with deficits. Um, so the question becomes, that's not the same kind of principle where you downregulate norepinephrine, you less presynaptic norepinephrine, you upregulate beta receptors, et cetera. So it doesn't happen preclinically. And clinically, the real issue would be, if this is compensatory, then it's good. It helps compensate for a deficient serotonin system. If it's an additional or synergistic hit, then it may be bad because it's found in suicide and aggression, et cetera, in which case antagonists would be helpful. So you have two different predictions. Agonists would help, in fact, if it's compensatory. It would be a good thing to increase serotonergic activity to a antagonist would be um, hurtful and the opposite if it's an independent finding. Now, in the preclinical literature, antagonists do reduce aggression in animal models. In humans, um, you know, the critical test is a two-way antagonist, but olanzapine, for example, and some of the atypicals have been very helpful for aggression. It appears in part distinct from the D2 antagonism because the typical neuroleptics don't have quite as beneficial effects as some of the atypicals. So that's still an indirect test. But that would be one way to tease these things apart. The other thing may be what kind of samples you're looking at, because we found different results with increases in very aggressive samples. And unless there's current prominent physical aggression, we don't see the two-A changes. Um, so just thoughts about that, and maybe we can pick it up in the treatment section at the end of the panel, but. Well, olanzapine is a good example because it also has some modulating effects on depressive mood and is a 2A receptor block in, uh, blocker. It, it, olanzapine's been shown to improve dysthymic mood. Right, right, but it does, it does counter the upregulation. So you'd think that it would make people worse if that was compensatory. That's, that's just the point there, but I think we need to look at two-A antagonists specifically to test that. So another question is, how does the hypofrontality of borderline differ from hypofrontality of schizophrenia? Well, I can't answer that in great depth, but I can uh, certainly acknowledge that that's been described in both syndromes. Again, um, the overlap in pathology doesn't mean that the two are related to all of the all the signs and symptoms the same. I can't really can't really give you an in-depth explanation except that it does there is an identical finding um, in prefrontal cortex of schizophrenic individuals. I'm not sure that anyone's actually looked or compared borderlines to schizophrenics in, in a, the same study. Well there are or, differences in the region because if you're looking in schizophrenia primarily at the more lateral, lateral dorsolateral regions which are involved in more cognitive function where here you're looking well, this is hypofrontality. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. The, there, these are more medial regions right. than the orbital frontal. There are different that, regions, yeah. So, um, here's a question that came up. You talked about the hippocampus in terms of emotional memory. And this question was, based on Ledoux's work on memory, is hippocampus affected by amygdala memories of emotion? Because the amygdala is actually the repository of a lot of the emotional conditioning rather than hippocampus, which it works in concert with. Yeah, the... The theory right now, I mean, of course, there's a, there are circuitry connections between the two, but the theory is that, that the job of the hippocampus is really to compare incoming stimuli. That's what you're seeing and feeling right now in the outside world with experience of the past, and then to advise, if you will, uh, the prefrontal cortex on whether behavioral responses are appropriate, inappropriate, but to reconcile what you're seeing out there with what's already in the data bank. Um, this question has come up a couple times now for you, before for Harold. Um, can you make a diagnosis of BPD by looking at their MRI or by viewing neuroimaging data alone? No, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not, not by a long shot. As I said earlier, and I, I want to reiterate, the, the technology has far outstripped our understanding of our data and our results. We're scrambling to find explanations for what we're seeing using the new, the new tools. 
another question, what are community suicides when you say over a third of community suicides have BPD? Are these in the general community as opposed to institutionalized or is this overall? No, these are, these are studies generally, I think these are uh, the studies that I quoted were from Isomitsa. These are studies of um, populations, he's in Finland I believe, looking at uh, databases of an entire population and then identifying what the cause of death or what the psychological background was of individuals who suicided over a fixed period of time. So community suicide means just that. They're, they're population databases of, of suicides in a community or in a, uh, a region. And I, his uh, Isomitsa, I believe, is in, in uh, Iceland. Why are there limited studies of age in borderline personality disorder? Do you see it as an important variable to differentiate between ages in borderline patients? And there have been, uh, just to add to that question, studies of the course of borderline yeah. and Michael Stone and others and now the new longitudinal studies. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I think when, we're, when we get into the, um, into the more general discussion of the meaning of borderline personality disorder, uh, it's relevant to this issue. What we're really looking at are uh, personality traits. We're looking at what Dr. Siever has called en uh, endophenotypes, impulsive aggression, affective instability, uh, and these change over time. Impulsive aggression, for example, diminishes with age. Um, it's not unique to borderline personality disorder. It's found everywhere. It's found throughout the general population, um, probably in a bell-shaped curve pattern if you looked, but most diagnostically in psychiatry, in antisocials, in borderlines, uh, some paranoid patients, uh, et cetera, in, in higher proportion. Uh, that changes. Impulsive aggression as a temperamental trait diminishes with age over time. Most prominent in younger years and diminishes to the point of disappearing largely, uh, I'd say by the 40s and 50s. So you wouldn't want to look for borderline personality disorder in a population of 50 year olds or older. They do exist, but they do not, they're not diagnosable by the same criteria that we're using for younger people. Uh, if you follow Mary Zanarini's research, about 75% of people who have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder will no longer have that diagnosis six years from the point of, of research intake. And what disappears are the state symptoms, like angry outbursts or impulsive behavior or even suicidal behaviors. Those diminish with time. What we're looking at in my research is the hardcore. We believe we're looking at the 25% that continue to uh, demonstrate impulsivity over long periods of time. But again, the literature is very strong that impulsivity diminishes with age. So, so we, would, we would not open our research to the full spectrum. It wouldn't be practical. So your data, because 5-HE2A receptors diminish with age, would right. be consistent with the longitudinal data in borderline in a broad sort of way. Well, we have no cause and effect. Yeah. yeah, there's no cause and effect. But again, you wouldn't want to look at the 5-HT2A receptor in elderly patients. Right, but I, I'm just saying in terms of the course of illness, what about, but the gender findings don't seem to fit together between the 2A and borderline, right? Because the males were higher in your right. sample, but right. the prevalence is greater in female. Do you, any thoughts on that? I know you're not saying this is a determining factor. No, I'm saying we have, we have five male borderlines and, and ten healthy <laughs> controls, so we need a larger sample. But if this, if this trend continues, then we'll have a problem explaining that. Right. It's I mean, in the opposite have, direction that we would predict. Right. We haven't seen, by the way, the gender differences, the age effects we okay. see in larger cohorts. But, and um, the gender difference is present even in our normal controls. Really? But we haven't seen that again, but that's with MDL. Yeah. So... Um, but we do see the most robust aggression, physical aggression in males, yeah. if, where we're not looking specifically for borderline. So that's another question. It partially depends on how you parse or select your samples. That's, I think that's a really important point to, to make, that your samples are selected using Kokero's uh, intermittent explosive disorder. You're looking at currently aggressive people. Right. We're looking at people who meet borderline criteria, and if they happen to have explosive right. behavior, that's a plus, but it's not the intake criterion. Right, and you didn't really find much 
We the found increases in aggression in your BPD sample. Condition. In fact, our, right. One of the surprising things was there was no statistically significant difference in aggression between right. our borderline patients and our control patients. So that may be a difficult sample to actually evaluate with respect to the relationship of aggression and 5-HD2A because well, you probably don't have the high end of the variance. When we look at people who aren't currently physically aggressive, we don't see elevations in the two way. Right, no, that's, Most that, of our patients are, in fact, borderline, yeah. but they're not all borderline. In, in, in other words, they don't comprise the universe of borderlines. They're in, kind of a subset of people who are very physically aggressive. We may be actually looking at people who have higher affective instability than, because so many of our subjects are, are suicide attempters. Um, we may be picking up that spectrum. Okay, I think we're right about lunchtime now. I don't know if there are any general announcements, uh, Perry, that you have. Otherwise, I understand we're reconvening at 145, correct? And lunch is on your own. There are plenty of places on Madison or around the institution. Thank you.